So, good afternoon, ladies and uh, gentlemen. Welcome to the last presentation of today's session of uh, Toronto Interpreters Practice Group. And for those of you who were here on July 8th, this is the second part of my, my presentation on that day. As you remember, we were in the classroom because the lab was under construction, so we did it as a consec. So what I will do in the interest of time, I'll just maybe skip the first part. I'll just briefly tell you, for those of you who weren't here, that I started off with the Green Revolution. So the topic of my presentation is vertical farming. And to lead up to the subject of vertical farming, I talked briefly about the Green Revolution, about uh, the history of uh, agriculture for the past uh, hundred and something years. So I talked about um, transformation in agriculture to produce more products how it started in the 50s and 60s. Uh, I mentioned the name of Norman Borlaug, who is considered the father of the Green Revolution. Um, I talked about some positive achievements of the Green Revolution movement, um, and also about the negative impact. And the negative impact is what uh, got people thinking about some new solutions to the uh, agriculture crisis uh, on our planet. Okay, so these are, these are some figures from the UN. Um, okay, so vertical farming. So vertical farming, is a, this is an innovating, innovative approach to farming. And this is something interesting because, as uh, Audrey mentioned in her speech, she grew up in Paris. She is uh, uh, very foreign to the whole domain of agriculture. And I can say the same about myself, except that for the past few years, my husband has been growing tomatoes on our balcony. And he is completely fascinated with the process. So I can say that I'm a farmer's wife in a way. So he grows um, flowers and tomatoes. And it's in a way, it's a vertical farming because we do it in the city, indoors, in our own space. So I, I, I kind of I can relate more to this subject now than I could, let's say, five years ago. OK. So vertical farming, this is the picture. This is public access. I didn't steal anything. So this is a vertical farm from the outside. This is a hangar in uh, New Jersey, in the USA. And the, uh, it, it covers the territory of 7,000 square miles, or 70,000 square feet of floor space. So this is a farm. This is a modern farm. Looks like a shopping mall more than a farm. And that's what it looks like inside. So on the inside, we see um, containers that are used for growing greens in this case. And they're stuck vertically. So because we're so short for space, we're utilizing our vertical space. So we're going upwards rather than um, covering kilometers of, uh, of uh, horizontal space. OK. so. When we adopt this system, we're talking about controlled environmental agriculture. So we use a special technology to control all environmental factors such as light, humidity, temperature, gases, etc. Um, vertical farming uses drip irrigation systems. That means that um, every plant receives as much water as it needs, and the water is not just randomly sprayed to cover a certain um, a certain number of um, kilometers of hectares or acres. Um, I'm going to talk about three types of vertical farming, which are soil free, by the way. That's another important um, component of vertical farming. They're soil free. I will be talking about hydroponics, aeroponics, and aquaponics. And I think this list, that's where I left off a month ago. OK. So hydroponics. Hydroponics means that plants grow in a mineral nutrient solution in a water solvent instead of soil. And this solvent can be static, or it can be um, in the form of a continuous flow. OK. So when we're talking about static uh, form, 
you see that uh, there is a container. It can be made of plastic. For, for example, recycled bottles are used to produce, to manufacture those containers. Uh, it can also be made of concrete, glass, wood, etc. So you see there is no soil inside the container. There is just the nutrient solution, and the roots are immersed in this solution. And um, of course, the, 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 the solution has to be changed regularly to avoid um, bacteria. OK. Another way of doing it is to place uh, plants inside a tube, or the roots of the plants inside a tube. And in this case, we're talking about the continuous flow approach. So plants grow in tubes, and those tubes are connected to a reservoir with the solvent. And it's actually a very neat idea, and I'll try to explain it to you in my, my own words, the way I understood it. So it's a very simplistic picture. But what happens, so you see two containers. So at the bottom right here, you see a nutrient pump. And that's where the nutrient solution is, um, is, is created first. So this device pumps this nutrient solution up into the pipe. Um, so the pipe is at an angle, and the solution flows past the roots and then drips back into the container. And on the right side, you see this is an air pump. I don't know if you can read from there, but that's what it says. It's an air pump that supplies the solution with oxygen, and the process, the cycle, begins again. So again, it, uh, the nutrient pump pumps it up and uh, so forth. So there are several variables uh, to regulate in this process to achieve the best results, such as the depth of uh, the solution, the, f the um, flow rate, and the slope angle. But this approach is better because it prevents the growth of bacteria. Oh, sorry, you can't hear me. 